Okay, so one of the things I've been doing is doing, like, a mini deep dive through Chinese classic literature, and I intend to read through all four of the the four great works of Chinese classic literature, that is Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Water Margin, Journey to the West, and Dream of the Red Chamber. Now, these four books, actually, they're, they're some of the longest books ever written. Each of them, each of them by themselves, rivals the length of Tolstoy's War and Peace, I don't have an exact word count because it's different translations, but they are of comparable size. And I'm actually getting through them. I finished uh, Water Margin twice, actually, and I finished Romance of the Three Kingdoms once. Along with this, some of the other things on my reading list are uh, Analects of Confucius. I finished that once by audiobook, but I want to read the physical copy, which I did get. A supplemental, just for better understanding, not exactly... Han Chinese culture, but a similar Eastern culture, more so the religion of Buddhism than Chinese culture, is Seven Years in Tibet. I have read that one as well. That book is about a mountain climber, actually. In the 1940s, his home country was Austria, and he traveled to the British colony of India to climb mountains. While he was there, of course, the Second World War kicked off, and him being a German citizen, uh-oh, prison camp. Him and a few others did escape, though, and he and another mountain climber actually stick together. They had a plan to go north over the Himalayas and into Tibet, which at the time was basically completely unexplored by any Western mind. And it talks about uh, some of the adventures they had. Like, eventually, they actually did get to the capital city, and uh, through a series of adventures and misadventures, they actually ended up being the tutors to the Dalai Lama, which is both, at the time, was that both their political and religious leader. That is the 14th Dalai Lama, the very same Dalai Lama that is still alive today. And as part of describing the culture, it also describes the religion, of course. The Tibetans believe the Dalai Lama is somebody who reached nirvana, like Buddha did, sitting under the tree. Except, instead of choosing to ascend and leave the mortal plane, he chose to instead stay behind and dedicate himself to people who are still living. There are a lot of examples in Buddhism of people who are said to have done this. They are called living Buddhas. The Dalai Lama is a very renowned one of these. And it goes into it, the, the, the times that he's reincarnated 14 times actually so far. And it goes into the process of searching out when a new child is born, that is the next incarnation of the Dalai Lama, and they show him objects that belong to the previous Dalai Lama, and they have a way to determine if the child, like, actually recognizes the objects, or if the child is pretending. Which is how they search out and determine if it actually is the reincarnation. Goes into all that, and also goes into their belief about not harming other life. It gives an example of a construction project that the author was going to oversee at the palace, and talking about his interactions with the workers that were digging the foundation. They were going so slow, and he figured out it was because they didn't want to accidentally kill an earthworm because the reason they gave him was the earthworm might very well have been the reincarnation of one of their grandmothers. So needless to say, they don't eat fish, don't eat meat, only vegetables, they are vegetarians. And the reason I recommend that book is because it goes so deeply into Buddhism, which is such a central part of Chinese culture. The Art of War, I'm pretty sure that book needs no introduction, and I won't spend too much time describing it. Tao Te Ching is also on my list, I did not get to read that one yet. I'll go back to Analects of Confucius. If I were to create a reading list and, like, put all the books in order of which one you should read first, I'm not sure where I would actually place this, because it's... Without the narrative, without the color that the two great books that I've read so far, Water Margin and Romance of the Three Kingdoms, without those character examples to lean back on when we're going into this, the book seems a lot more dry. It's a philosophical work. It was written by the followers of Confucius, written about Confucius himself and his philosophy and his teachings, basically. Confucius lived during the Warring States period. His philosophy is a product of that, but also a product of Eastern culture and Eastern mindset, but also it helped to shape Chinese culture and mindset and government for 
thousands of years to come. Stuff like filial piety, stuff like how to govern, stuff like where your priority should be in governing. And it is a different style of governmental advice, a different philosophy of government than we're used to thinking about in the West. Romance of the Three Kingdoms, I actually read that after Water Margin. Uh, if I were to make a reading list and put all the books in order of when you should read them, I would say The Art of War before Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and then Water Margin after Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Reason being, The Art of War is quoted quite a bit in Romance of the Three Kingdoms, to the point where I knew a lot of the a lot of the individual sayings by heart just from having heard the characters quote them so often. Attack where the enemy is not expecting, a general in the field may disobey the orders of the king or the emperor, stuff like that. Um, what the book is actually about is historical fiction. It covers the story of the Three Kingdoms period, and it follows very closely a long historical document that I think the title is called uh, Annals of the Three Kingdoms or something like that, and it basically gives more color to that while deviating from actual history a little bit for literary effect. And pausing right there to tell you about the premise, something I find interesting as a difference between Eastern and Western thought is the fact that one of their greatest works is a historical fiction. And not just following individual characters and the situations, no, it, it's a historical fiction that describes the wider course of governments and kingdoms. To give you a little bit of context for my confusion at this, imagine if instead of Romeo and Juliet or Hamlet or Macbeth, imagine if Shakespeare's most famous play was like I don't know, Richard II, or Richard III, or Henry, whatever number. Imagine that. Like, imagine if people in the West were just this amped up about a king that lived thousands of years ago. Imagine if we were that excited that uh, the stories that shape our culture, it's not King Arthur, no, no, no. It's not the Grimm Brothers fairy tales, no, 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 no. Imagine if the stories that shape our culture are basically a dramatized version of Richard Lionheart's life that focuses not even too much on his interpersonal relationships, but more heavily leans on what kind of a ruler he was, what kind of a general he was. Imagine if that's what people in the West got excited about, and this is the kind of book that Romance of the Three Kingdoms is. It describes the fall of the Han Dynasty, and how the three rival kingdoms that emerged out of that dynasty sort of got established, and then it follows the story of like three or four generations of rulers of those kingdoms before eventually one kingdom eats up the other two and then a new dynasty is established and Chinese history continues. Descriptions of battles, descriptions of how generals act in the field, descriptions of military campaigns and who the top advisors are for the governmental affairs. And what it lacks more than anything is that interpersonal element. When it does get into the details of someone's life, it usually follows the story of how those details impact the wider kingdom through their work in such an important position. For example, if someone's allowed mouth and gets on the bad side of the emperor, or if there's a dispute over some concubine that is playing the field between two important people in the kingdom. The focus is rarely on someone's personal affairs. The focus is more often on the dynasty, the lineage, the kingdom, the governance. And that's the part that's been, as a Westerner going into this, that's the part that's been hardest to wrap my mind around when I'm getting into the narrative. Now, just to put more into perspective what this book feels like to read, Imagine we are tasked with making a 2,000-page book about President FDR's life. So, how are we going to go about this? What parts are we going to focus on? Let's start with this guy. Okay, he's, he's in a wheelchair. We need a footnote about that. Uh, his wife did this, this, and this. Notable things. Okay, we need a few footnotes about that. Now, let's get to the exciting parts. His presidency, the War in the Pacific. Let's home in on just a snapshot from the middle of the book. Let's say the Battle of Peleliu. Here's the juicy bits. Okay, so we got the U.S. Navy coming in on this island. They have this many destroyers. They have this many aircraft carriers. They have this many landing craft and this many soldiers storming the beach. They start landing at this time of day. The American commander, General MacArthur, is known for making impulsive decisions. He did this and this during the battle. The Japanese commander on the island 
he has this sort of disposition, and his decisions in the battle played out this and this way. One side or the other had this piece of equipment which gave them the edge on this part of the battle. Now here comes the exciting part, here's the plot twist. The wave of American landing ships that came after the beach was secured. Those were the resupply boats, the boats that had the fresh equipment for the people that secured the beach. Now the people who packed the supplies onto those boats, here's the plot twist, of course they packed the essential items first, the, the things that the soldiers would need right away, when in those boats very first and then later on they packed in the stuff that they wouldn't need until later that night or maybe the next morning. Well, then when they unpacked them, if you're unpacking a boat that's designed sort of like a shipping container, of course, first in, last out. So they opened it up and the first thing they see was the stuff that was non-essential, the stuff they wouldn't need until later on. They're on a beach getting shot at by Japanese. They just rip the stuff out disorganized trying to get to the stuff in the back that they need right away. And of course the tide comes in and they lost this and this much equipment this way because of the inattention of the people that packed the boats. Those people, if this were ancient China, they might have gotten banished, they might have gotten beheaded. If the commander was feeling nice that day, they might have gotten dishonorably discharged. But this is not ancient China, this is the 20th century American military, so maybe they just got a whole month of being responsible for cleaning the toilets. Now, on to the next part of the battle. On and on, imagine 2,000 pages of that. Imagine now that instead of Mark Twain, one of the greatest American authors would be people who write in the style of describing slightly fictionalized history in just a slightly dramatized way like that. And that's, that's why I'm so puzzled why Romance of the Three Kingdoms, of all books, is something that has a huge effect on Chinese culture. And even when you go on to a book like Water Margin, which is next, you get characters later on in Chinese history who know the stories of these earlier characters well enough that they give themselves or they give each other nicknames based off those earlier characters. Now, moving on to Water Margin, it is still loosely historical fiction, but it's much more fiction, much less dry, much less focused on the government and military matters, and much more focused on everyday people and the way that they lived. The setting of the story is late in the Song Dynasty, which was a time that was notorious for political corruption. And the story follows these 108 characters. They're called heroes. Canonically, they are incarnations of otherworldly demons, but they're born as humans. Many of them are forced into a life of banditry. Some of them choose it willingly. Some of them, it goes into great detail about how they make every effort to be an upstanding citizen, but they are just absolutely betrayed by the corruption of other officials, government officials, and given no other choice but to live a life being an outlaw. So these 108 bandits gradually get together and form a stronghold and an actual sizable, respectable army at a place called Liangshan Mountain, a place that has a good deal of natural defenses around it. It's surrounded by a marsh, and of course, these bandits have generals that are well worth their salt. They're able to successfully repel and humiliate multiple government armies that are sent to wipe them out, and then they're able to send their own armies to accomplish their own goals in the surrounding area. And very visibly in the book, they're portrayed as heroes. They're portrayed as like Robin Hood type figures, steal from the rich, give to the poor, but all throughout the book, I I'm getting into spoiler territory here if you couldn't tell, all throughout the book, they make very questionable actions, very questionable decisions, very morally gray. Lots of innocent people get killed, lots of civilian homes get burned, but all throughout the book, they're hyping each other up, like, oh, sworn brother, you are so honorable, you have all these good qualities. And meanwhile, the corrupt officials that come out against us, oh, these fiends, they are keeping the emperor in the dark while being corrupt. They are ruining and pillaging the country while the emperor's eyes are closed, while the emperor is kept blind to all the horrible things that they're doing. Which brings me to one theme that Water Margin and Romance of the Three Kingdoms have in common, actually. In Water Margin, you see repeated over and over that the Emperor is honorable despite the corruption of all the officials and basically the entire government structure. And in Romance of the Three Kingdoms, you see the idea that reunification of the Three Kingdoms is both the goal and the inevitability is just a question of which one, which ruling family gets to be in control of all that. So very much there's this idea that one government infallible emperor, and that's something else that is unfamiliar to my western mind when I look at it from outside perspective. And yes indeed, both sides are pretty bad to just regular people who just want to live their lives. 
But then, all of a sudden, funny, funny how this happens, as soon as they want to negotiate with one of these government officials, all of a sudden they put on the used car salesman pitch, Oh, good sir, I'm sure you're honorable. I'm sure you're an upstanding citizen. Here's, here's our story. Oh, pity us. If you would be so kind as to deliver this message, or to let us do this or that, or if you'd be so kind as to come join us for a feast, and maybe consider joining our stronghold, stuff like that. And the way the book ends is eventually negotiations are had with the government and the capital. Eventually, all the bandits on the mountain are given an amnesty on the condition that they allow their army to become a government army and they go wherever the government tells them and they go crush rebels and invaders and whoever the government doesn't like. So that's all well and good. So the book has a whole segment dedicated to all their military campaigns. And then the 108 brothers, the 108 ear heroes, they start dying off. Gradually, there's fewer and fewer of them. And it gets to a point where there's only a handful left. And the leader of these 108, his name is Sung Jang. Spoiler alert, he, in the end, he gets poisoned. And at that point, the final two heroes, the final two chiefs of that bandit stronghold were poisoned along with him. And on its face, I would say the book seems to suggest, as far as a takeaway moral lesson from this, I would say it seems to suggest that you can't trust a corrupt person, you can't negotiate with a corrupt person, that it's useless to stand on your values in a world where everyone's cutthroat, where everyone just is only out for themselves. In a world where people value their own well-being more than what's morally good or more than what's good for other people. Which brings us around to my one-word summary of the takeaway. The word is subjectivity. The bandits, they call themselves virtuous and noble and honorable. They call the other side uh, fiendish, corrupt, devilish, traitors even. And then, of course, if you get to the other side, the government troops, the government generals, they say the exact same things about themselves that the bandits are saying about each other. It's just inverted. They say the exact same things about the bandits that the bandits are saying about them. So, subjectivity. This book displays it to the point where adjectives just have no meaning. The only thing it tells you when someone says a good thing about this person or a bad thing about that person, the only thing it tells you is whether or not those people are friends or enemies with each other. It doesn't actually tell you anything about the person's character. And I actually take it as a warning against having an excess of subjectivity. I take it as a caution that we should be able to recognize positive qualities in people, even people who we consider to be ideological opponents or political opponents. Something else I'll say about Water Margin, I listened to it, and Romance of the Three Kingdoms too, actually, in audiobook form, of course, but the way I listened to it was a YouTube channel, multiple channels actually, but it's the same guy, uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms podcast and Water Margin podcast. I believe now that he finished Water Margin, he's combining all of his content into one channel, which is Chinese Lore podcast. And he does have a website as well. I'll find that and link that in the description. That is my preferred way to listen to these books. And honestly, even though Red Chamber and Journey to the West are absolutely both on my reading list, I would not trust myself reading those books without his commentary. Because this guy was born in China. He speaks both Chinese and English fluently. Presents the stories to an English audience. And he just does a really great job explaining it explaining the historical context, explaining the cultural meanings and which parts of the stories that Chinese culture has really grabbed onto and pays a lot of attention to. So I definitely want to give him a lot of credit for his work because it's I've been following his channel for a while, and even for years before I've been following, it's taken him years to read and research and translate and present his voice recordings of him reading the English versions of these books. So, major thank you to him. And I suppose I'll make more videos about Chinese literature when I get around to reading them. Which, that might honestly be a while because I'll be waiting on that podcast to finish recording all those episodes. It might take a while, it will take years, but it's definitely going to be worth it. I, like I said, I don't trust myself reading and interpreting those books without his commentary. So that's what I got so far. Hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you later.